Well, <clears throat> I'm going to play a little music for you today. <clears throat> We're going to start with a little bit of Bach. Because I want, to hear, I want you to hear Wagner in contrast to what had been the prevailing kind of flavor of music up until that time, right? You all will recognize this style of music. It's Baroque. It's uh, kind of that... 17th, 18th century stuff, and it sounds like this. <laughs> now, as you listen to this, I want you to think, what is the message of the music? What is the message of the music? music communicating about life, its meaning, what just comes to mind? Nicole? It's the feeling of joy and excitement. Okay, there's and joy. The possibility that life actually does have meaning. All right, life does have meaning forever. I was just going to say, it seems a little bit more optimistic. It's optimistic, that's right. Anything else? That's all good. Josiah? There's many parts, but they all work together. That's right. Many parts working together. Every little instrument has its own part, and each one is separately. Might not make a lot of sense, but somehow all together it just is pleasing. Anything else? Those are all good answers. Just orderliness, isn't it? There's a sense of joyful orderliness about life in that music, right? Now, not many years after that style, you would have, and this is groundbreaking, that this would be Wagner.
impressions of that music. Um, I get a sense of the father of Charlie Sheen and then also Apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What else? What are, what's the emotion there? What's going on? Yeah. I don't know the emotion, but that first part with the, I don't know what instrument that is. Is that, it's just not fun to listen to. Like, mm. I, I heard it and it was just kind of, yeah. It, yeah, it was it, not fun to listen to. Well, I'm not sure what instrument that was. It may have, do you know what? The, I was thinking it was violin, but it could be kind of a screechy violin kind of thing. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. Okay. What else? What's what's the message of the music? Yeah. It was a little more chaotic. Chaotic. Right. I mean, there's a little order to it, but it's kind of a chaotic order, isn't it? Not like Bach. What else? What images come to mind? Well, it just made me kind of Bach kind of made me feel you know happy a little bit, and then this one kind of made me feel a little down. Okay, down. It, it was pessimistic. Pessimistic. I, I'll tell you, it, okay, that's good. I, I don't want to add my thoughts here yet, but what else, Ben? Well, the high violence throughout kind of gave the impression of flying, and then the, the darker, um, or lower notes kind of uh, said this dark anticipation feeling. Okay. So it kind of... Let me ask if the high stuff made you feel like flying, did it make you feel like flying in the sense that you're sort of safe and secure? Well, I, 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 I was flying like something was mm. flying towards me. Oh, okay, okay. All right, good, all right. What else? I think this is because I've seen a video where uh, while this was playing, but I thought of... Uh, Hitler's army, like as they're marching, I think that's been that's played in some movie while they're marching. It could be uh, Hitler uh, liked Wagner, uh, but in fact the music that he used to inspire the Nazi military forces was not this kind of music. It was bombastic march music, you know, more like John Philip Sousa kind of stuff. <clears throat> But he liked this music. He considered Wagner the great, the most wonderful composer of all German history. You know. Does this music relax you? Would you kind of put this on to sit by the fire and read it? You know, like, no, it's, it creates anxiety, doesn't it? It creates a feeling of anxiety, a feeling that you're not in control of your life, right? That there are forces, I, I, you know, what Ben said, uh, Something's coming at you, and you don't have a lot to say about it. I mean, I'll tell you, the image that comes to mind is, we were saying yesterday, that leaf kind of carried along the rushing, raging river, and you're just sort of helpless in this kind of this craziness that... This is Schopenhauer. This is the flavor of Schopenhauer. That's why sometimes music can say, in three minutes, more than an hour lecture can say. You know, you just have to feel it. But as you read Schopenhauer, that's the sense that you get is that we are victims of these forces and the forces that rage in some way are forces within us, not just forces around us, that we are being carried along. And all we can do in response to this is just experience it and express it artistically and, and try to not be too victimized by it, but really in the final analysis we're pretty helpful. So anyway, there's a little bit of Wagner. We're going to come back. When we come to Nietzsche, we'll revisit Wagner a bit and uh, Schopenhauer as well. We are, I think uh, you've probably already heard, I don't know if you've heard it from others, but uh, we are implementing, as of a faculty meeting yesterday, the little five-minute reflection at the beginning of class. Um, I was the one dissenting vote, of course. <clears throat> the, uh, the guy that I want to move to today, by the way, tomorrow, we are going to hear from, who are we hearing from? Who's, oh, Alicia, that's right, who's not here. Ah, oh, dear. All right. She's going to be talking about Schleiermacher. I want to sandwich in today a discussion of a guy that many people don't know much about, but he's, again, had a huge influence. 
And I think we can just tuck him into this one period. So that's my hope, my objective. <clears throat> Conti, once again, is on the pessimistic side. So we'll group him with Schopenhauer, but he's very different from Schopenhauer. He does not see us as victims. He sees us as masters. So in some ways you're getting both ends of the spectrum here. But nevertheless, he also agrees with those who say that that noumenal level of Kant, there's no way to recover it because it is not there. So he denies it. And he says, we have to make sense not referring to universals, which are found upstairs in Kant's noumenal world, we have to make sense based on particulars. And you might call his philosophy particularism, but don't. Okay? Because that's not a term that's used. But I want you to understand the term that is used means basically particularism, but the term is Anybody know? It'd be the synops, a synonym for particularism, but the word that's commonly used is, you know, I've mentioned it before but not emphasized it, <laughs> positivism. So please, whenever from this date on, you hear the term positivism, and by the way, you will hear it more than you might think. You'll hear the term tucked in. I've heard of, for example, legal positivism, you know, that kind of thing. Anytime you hear the word positivism, to help yourself remember it, just think in terms of particularism. It's a, it's a way of trying to make sense out of human life based not on universal ideas, truth, beauty, so on, such as we find in Plato, but simply try to make sense out of things based strictly on particulars, details. It'd be sort of like me walking into this classroom with 10,000 BBs, you know, and just dumping them randomly on the floor. Particulars. BBs thrown all over the floor. I went through a BB phase when I was a kid. Most kids do. Slingshot BBs, you know, CO2 gun BBs and all of that. We actually had those back then in the caves. Can you believe it? We had it when I was a kid. <clears throat> and um, go out and shoot the pterodactyls out of the sky. It was really kind of fun. And, uh, but anyway, my mother finally banned BBs from the house. Because one of the really irritating things about BBs is they just get everywhere, under the sofa, in the corners, you know, everywhere you look, there's more BBs around. And, and they're just sort of random. They're nonsensical. They're pretty. But they're just irritating if you're the mom in the house. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I'd like you to imagine if I just dumped 1,000, 10,000 BBs on the floor and then told you to make sense out of it. You know, interpret that and try to make it meaningful, then that's what you've got. That's positivism. Because that's really what we're dealing with in life. We're just dealing with a bunch of particulars. All right. <clears throat> Comte is therefore reacting negatively to Hegel. Comte, along with Schopenhauer, react negatively, critically, rejecting Hegel. Hegel thinks we can recover the noumenal in history through his dialectical triad. Comte disagrees. He says there is no absolute spirit or any of that nonsense. There's just the concrete and mortar of this world, and we have to make sense out of it, and we shouldn't be appealing to these metaphysical ideas like a great spirit, absolute ego, reason, and all of that's nonsense for him. There are certain terms that are associated with Comte. One of them is this term positivism. He is also the inventor of the term sociology. 
So if you, heaven forbid, run off to college and major in sociology, that's right down there at the bottom with journalism, <laughs> education, <laughs> communications. No, don't waste your college education on that stuff. You can pick that up in two weeks, you know. If you're going to spend the money on college, then for crying out loud, get an education. Don't waste your time on journalism. Please, don't do that. Not that I have strong feelings on the subject, but, you know. <laughs> I hope I'm reaching somebody causing repentance to take place here. Yes? Well, there are three majors that are worth going to college. History. History is great. Mathematics is fine. Um, anything that is substance. Philosophy is fine. You know. uh, but uh, you see, there's some here, let me just say it this way, there's some, there's some subject matter that is form, and there is some subject matter that is matter. And you want matter, you want substance, you want material. Journalism is form. You should all, you know, what is that? That's just how to communicate. Well, you can already communicate. You, already, you got that. You got that down, so don't worry about it. You can do fine. It's, it's not that you can communicate, it's what do you communicate? Is there anything in there to communicate? You know, that's the question. But I don't want to influence any of you, of course, <laughs> even handed about it. The other term that's sometimes associated with Comte is the term scientism. Scientism. Not science. Science is simply the investigation by way of observation of the world around us and categorizing our findings into rational sort of classes of information. I look at 35 objects and I say 14 of those are flowers. That's science, you know, so I'm just categorizing experience. Scientism is a term that applies to what's sometimes called science in a closed system, meaning that all there is, is what can be discovered by science. That's all that is real. Science traditionally allows that there is non-scientific truth. You know, I mean, how do you put beauty in a test tube? How do you measure out three pounds of justice? You know, we believe that there is beauty. We believe that there is justice, but we don't believe that those are measurable in a centrifuge. We think there are certain things that are real, but not susceptible to scientific investigation. If you believe that the only thing that is real is what you can in fact measure in a scientific laboratory, then you have become a, you've, you've bought into scientism that the only real thing is that which is discoverable by science. That's scientism. You know. And Comte is really a scientist in that sense, committed to scientism. <clears throat> yes? Is that related to Scientology at all? No, it is not. Scientology is a cult that was started by L. Ron Hubbard, and it is so not scientific, it's scary. You know? So, Scientology started as a little pop psychology book written in the 50s entitled Dianetics. But it was so successful that L. Ron Hubbard morphed it into a religion. And the more books he sold, the more bizarre it got. So that eventually, well, We'll go into the details of it, but it just became so outrageous that you can hardly believe sane people like Tom Cruise. When you <laughs> well, there you are. Anyway, uh, that's not the same thing at all. All right. Comte gave what he called universal laws. There's three of them. The law of progress, the law of knowledge, the law of science. Comte is another of these guys. If Jacob were here, I'd be 
mentioning it to him, because he tends to pick up on these sort of internal inconsistencies. But Comte is another of these characters who is more or less self-refuting. He denies that there are universals, and then he comes right back around the back door and talks about universal laws. You know, wait, whoa, whoa, you can't do it that way. You, know, you can't. <clears throat> You can't play in both ball fields like that. That's not you know, the way it's done. But he has these, what he calls universal laws. And the first one is the law of progress. And it has three phases. So I want to give you briefly a discussion of each of these. And having done that, we've got all we need from Comte. So the law of progress. <clears throat> He says that as we survey history, we see three phases. The first of these he calls the theological phase. Theological phase. The second one is the metaphysical. And the third is the positivistic. The theological phase is the most um, unsophisticated, backwards, rudimentary. The theological phase is where we actually try to explain the mysteries of the universe by appealing to God. We see things in the universe that we don't get things that are mysterious to us, things that baffle us, and instead of approaching them scientifically, trying to give rational explanations for these things, we appeal to that mythical character known as God. And he says Christianity is the supreme example of this. It's the worst of the worst. So he is a vicious critic of uh, the Christian faith in, gener er, in particular and, uh, and theism in general. Now he says that eventually people grow out of the theological phase and they move to what he calls the metaphysical stage. And this stage is one in which you now don't explain things in terms of God, but you explain things in terms of unseen forces. And he has in mind here Hegel. Hegel's absolute spirit, Hegel's reason with a capital R, Hegel's absolute ego. All of these are appeals to an unseen reality not much different from God. He says it's a little better, but not much. So he has disdain for the study of metaphysics as well as a disdain for the study of theology. He says both of them are a colossal waste of time almost up there with majoring in journalism. I mean, they're just completely useless. <laughs> and Comte wants to move us to what he believes is the only legitimate place for the human mind to rest and to be about its labors. And this is what he calls the positivistic stage. And he introduces to us then what he calls the age of science. He, of course, is coming off the heels of the so-called scientific revolution. And he believes the achievements of the scientific revolution have proven that we no longer need to appeal to God and appeal to these ridiculous, you know, extraneous, unseen forces. That now we can explain everything by the proper application of science. And this is what he calls positivism. And I'm going to give you now a definition, or a, maybe a phrase, well, a statement, I guess we'll do it this way, which represents the spirit of positivism. And I'd like you to learn this so well that you can repeat it in your sleep. Not because I want you to believe it, but because I want you to spot it whenever it comes and tries to bite you in your ankle. Here it is. Yes, your ankle. 
<laughs> ankle, yeah. This is important, ankle. <laughs> you know, most of the time I just make this stuff up. You know that, don't you? Here it is. Here's the, uh, here's the statement. No explanation of observable phenomena are permissible except those that are themselves observable phenomena. I can only explain the things that I see, in a sense, by means of other things that I can see. It's against the rules to appeal to things unseen to account for things that are seen. You follow that? This is scientism. This is positivism. Anything, in other words, up here at the level of the noumena is unseen and hence cannot be part of any explanation of anything that is seen. This is, you know, very much a part of the whole debate in our culture over evolution. I've had this conversation, maybe you have too. Somebody committed to evolution, and, you know, you might say, well, I don't, it doesn't make much sense to me, this whole evolutionary idea you've got that as a matter of pure randomness, you know, some molecules bumped into each other and bingo, you got a little bit of DNA and out of that, after a couple of billion years, crawls a human being. I mean, really, come on, that seems a little over the top. I'm not so sure that any person exercising a certain amount of common sense would just accept that. And so the question goes back, well, what's your alternative? What's your alternative explanation for the fact that we have the human species running around loose on this planet. And I say, well, you know, um, how about God did it? <laughs> how about that for an explanation, I say, as a Christian, you know? How about that one? The guy immediately says, nope, nope, that is not science. I'm asking what is your scientific explanation for the fact that there are human beings running around on this planet? God is not part of the world of science. Can't measure, can't see, can't weigh, can't anything. God is off limits. That's against the rules of good science to appeal to an unseen thing force like God. So, strike one, foul ball. What's your next possibility? I say, oh, well, I see. Hmm. I can't appeal to God. How about we, we don't know? You know, then he says, ah, I <laughs> gotcha. Because don't you understand that science is always in the process of moving from relatively, please hear this, from relatively inferior to relatively improved explanations for things. And I have here an explanation. It may have problems. I grant you, I'm speaking as a Darwinian, my Darwinian hypothesis may have problems. I grant it is really pretty stunning to imagine that this is the way life has come down to us. But it's the best explanation out there that abides within the canons of science and doesn't leap outside the scientific box to metaphysical explanations. And so until you as a Christian can, can, can provide a, an improved explanation that submits to the canons of science, Darwin wins. And you know what? He's right. If you are going to restrict yourself to a positivistic way of approaching truth, Darwin is the best answer out there for how we have human life on this planet. You follow that. That's the way, that's the end run you'll deal with every day of the week. If you really look closely at it when you're dealing with an evolutionist. They will always accuse you of bringing religion into the discussion. And religion is not science, therefore religion is against the rules, therefore that explanation doesn't count. You've got to stay within the rules of Comte's positivism. And even people that never heard of Comte play by those rules. You follow that, you see that that's the world of scientific labor in which you find yourself, yeah. So how would a positivist explain something like anger or love or... Um, Chemicals. You know, your anger 
is probably the result of a combination of adrenaline, something else being dumped out by your adrenal gland, and you know it's caused by whatever you know circumstances you find yourself in, and and it's that's all it is. That would be their explanation. Same explanation applies to love, to all the things that we think are more transcendent. These are just chemicals. And you are just a chemical reaction. Kayla, I hate to break it to you. You are just a chemical reaction. <laughs> Buzz disappears. Josiah. How does a positivist prove that their epistemological claim is true, that it can be verified by being seen? Uh, they don't. They presuppose it. And this is the key. The way to deal with someone who is doing this is to say, you realize that your rules, the rules you've just given me, which is stated simply, no ex ex explanation of observable phenomena are permissible except those that are themselves observable phenomena. That's the rules you're trying to impose on me. That is a philosophical assumption. That is not science by anybody's measures. That is philosophy. So you have brought a particular philosophy to the table and told me I have to play by those rules. And I said, well, why do I have to play by those rules? You know, what authority said that such that I'm bound to believe it? On the face of it, it's fairly ridiculous to say that everything that is true in the universe must submit to this rather tiny little compartment in which you're trying to place it. You know. So Josiah, you know, when you have that conversation, that's, that's where you have to go. You have to go to their presuppositions and show how arbitrary they are. And by the way, it's usually not hard to show that they themselves don't live in that kind of positivistic universe any time except when they're debating this point with a Christian. And then all of a sudden they become you know, rigorous positivists. The rest of the time they live like a normal human, believing in beauty, love, all of these things that make life meaningful. It's only when it serves their purpose to be a positivist that they force you to be one so that they can win the argument. Does that make sense? That's the idea. Yeah, go ahead. I have a question. Why yeah. do they think that truth should be facade? Ah, so, yes. This is, this is the question that you'd like to put to Comte. Uh, so who cares? You know. But he cares. This is, this is where I'm saying a positivist typically is self-refuting in terms of the values that they themselves live by, the very fact that they want to do this stuff. And we'll talk in glowing terms about doing it for the benefit of humanity and all of this nonsense. Well, why bother? You know, if we're just, if like Kayla here, if she's just a chemical reaction, then who gives a rip? Who cares? We're just all chemical reactions. Doesn't make a bit of difference. You know, the, the whole idea of us having a meaningful life is nonsense. You take a little soda, put it in water, it's gone. And that's your life. That's all that amounts to. So what is that soda in the meantime, in that three seconds that it, that it fizzes, saying, oh, it's so meaningful to be here, fizzing away, and then it's gone. All right, so that's the uh, law of progress. Law of knowledge. This is Comte's analysis of academic disciplines. And what he says here is that knowledge begins at a level that's quite specific and easily measured and then gradually we have to push the boundaries to things that are more difficult to measure. But in the final analysis, all of these disciplines submit to the rules of positivism. So the first discipline would be mathematics. This is the lowest, the simplest, the most easily demonstrated. All right. Ah, I see. I got you. I wonder what in the world. 
Matthew's so angry at me. He's about to watch. He's out of here. He's had it with this nonsense, you know. Second discipline, astronomy. And of course, astronomy is not far from mathematics. We look at the movement of heavenly bodies, and we discover that by the application of mathematical principles and formulas, we can pretty much predict what we're seeing up there, so mathematics really leads us to astronomy. Then he says the third are what he calls the physical sciences. Physical sciences, things like chemistry, biology, anything that really represents what we would consider to be either observational or laboratory science, that kind of thing, you know. The last and most difficult, but nevertheless, a class that, that, that plays by the same rules is what he calls the social sciences. So out of this, he develops what he calls sociology, and which education, not long after Comte, began to sell to children as social studies, which we principally object to. We don't teach social studies because of its atheistic and positivistic roots, you see. But, everybody else in the world will, now, here's the thing you need to get. Social studies, social science, measures human behavior. All human behavior. The things we call moral behavior. Sexual behavior. Family behavior. Artistic behavior. All human behavior. And basically says, that the same kinds of rules that account for chemical reactions in a laboratory account for behaviors that we see in human life. If you go out and shoot somebody this afternoon, leave them bleeding in the street, you know, which I hope you don't do, that advocating that. But were you to do it, we should be able to explain that behavior in the very same way that we could explain a chemical reaction in the laboratory. It's simply physical, visible, demonstrable forces which have produced the things that you do. There was, some years back, in fact there still is, I don't hear so much about it anymore, a, a psychological theory called behaviorism. I was a psych major back in the 60s, and that was by far the most popular psychological paradigm in town. The F. Skinner behaviorism. All it is is Comte applied to human behavior, saying that everything that you do is predictable based on how you have been shaped, conditioned by your environment, and so on. There's no morality in that. There's no sense of virtue. What's that? I mean, virtue is nonsensical. If you just do what you've been conditioned to do, then you're just doing it. And that's the way it is. We don't have any idea of bravery, courage, you know, that idea. It's all gone. B.F. Skinner, by the way, who's the most famous psychological behaviorist, wrote his most famous book, and the title of his most famous book by this most famous behaviorist was, anybody know this, by the way? This book really got around for a while. Uh, it was entitled Beyond Freedom and Dignity. You know? And then he wrote another book called Walden II, which was sort of his follow-up to the original Walden, which was written by who? Who wrote the original Walden? Was it Thoreau? It was either Thoreau, I think it was Thoreau. But his whole, his whole point in that book was to say that, you know, be, human behavior is just produced by scientific forces, that's all. 
your faith in God is just produced by scientific forces. All right, so that's, uh, that's the idea. So uh, the point is that you start with math, and ultimately you could use math to explain every human behavior. But again, there's something self-refuting in this, isn't there? What is somewhat problematic in Comte's insistence that we can explain all human behavior in terms of simple mathematical measures? What's somewhat difficult for Comte himself as he makes that affirmation? Uh, I think the problem is, is that the only way that he got to that from his standpoint is that he was That's right. told to by the environment. Basically. That's right. Comte himself is just a product of behaviors. So why should I pay any attention to him? Anything he says is as much rigidly connected to this mathematical you know, formula as everything else. So I say, sorry, man, I'm going to dismiss you because by your own admission, you are nothing more than a product of the forces that have conditioned you. Why do I care about what forces have conditioned you? You know, so that never seems to trouble these people too much, but it should. All right. Um, the last one here, this uh, reference to science, I've, I've really covered it um, sufficiently in what we've already said. It really takes science and begins to spell it, you might say, with a capital S. Out of positivism comes a very closely related cousin philosophy called pragmatism. And the most, most famous pragmatist of the 19th century was, but you know, some, somebody's reporting on him, I think. The most famous pragmatist of the 19th century. Let's see if somebody's got this one. Ah, yes, Kayla, as a matter of fact, but she's just a chemical reaction, so. <laughs> Who are you reporting on, Kayla? You remember? <laughs> oh, wow. William something. William something, yeah, William something, that's right. Well, the name is William James. <coughs> All right. William James, so just make that little connection. William James is a descendant, philosophically, of Comte. Positivism gives us pragmatism, and who could tell me in one simple phrase what the philosophy of pragmatism is? How, who would like to define it in real simple terms? No, no hands in the air? Spencer, come on. Yeah. I think it's basically whatever works for you is right. Very close. Okay, well, whatever works is right. The, the sort of for you is a little bit of additional flavor later, but the, the fundamental philosophy of pragmatism is that things are true if they work. You know. We don't care much about why. All we care about is what. And so for Comte, that's a good little thing to keep in mind. In life, there are why questions and what questions. For Comte, the why doesn't matter. What we care about is what. What happens? How does it happen? How can we reproduce it? How can we make life for the human race better based on these pragmatic principles? How can we improve the human condition based on pure pragmatism? That's what he's all about. He brings in the backdoor metaphysics all the time. I hope you see that. You know, this is this is part of the. I mean, he's a great case study of the inconsistency of this kind of philosophy. Because as soon as he says something like, "How can we make the human situation better?" Well, how do you measure better? What does better look like? And immediately, when you're going to measure one human situation against another and say one is better, you've got something up there unseen by which you're making that judgment. You know, I mean, he's got metaphysics all over the place in his philosophy. 
but he doesn't want to admit it, and many people don't see it. They just think, oh, it's just better. All right, so that's complete. Questions, comments in the last 30 seconds? Was that the only part of science? Or yeah, just uh, really what you want to do with this science is just kind of put a capital S on it. Science virtually becomes the god to be worshipped, and the descendant of this is pragmatism. Yeah, so that's basically it. All right. Not even action.